And all of God's people said, Amen. A Greek word came to my mind a while ago when that sweet young lady was singing. Woo! Glory! <laughs> what a wonderful service. Brother Davis, orchestra, musicians, sound folks, choir, thank you, thank you. What a blessing for sweet Libby, my darling bride of 54 years. And uh, we have our son Joey and his two boys, uh, Sloan and Greer, with us this morning. So I've got my son, grandson, and my sweet little bride. And uh, they said, uh, Daddy, Papa, you just preach as long as will you want to. Uh, <laughs> we don't bother us. They didn't really say that, but I, that's what they were thinking. It is such an honor to be here. For those of you I haven't had the privilege of getting to know, 26 years ago, Sweet Libby and I uh, went into full-time evangelism. I had been pastor at Bartlett Baptist Church for nine years, and we found a church home here at First Baptist Millington, and Ray Newcomb was our pastor, and Brother Rusty Easton was our minister of music. And I, I'll tell you, those are glory, glory, glory days. And what an honor for us to be a part of that. And by the way, let me add quickly. You know, I'm so glad with God. It's kind of like the wedding in Cana of Galilee. Remember where they had the wedding and they ran out of wine? And Jesus turned the water into wine. And Mary, when she tasted the wine, she said, Wow, you've saved the best for now. So what I'll say to you is those were glory days. But today, God's saving is best for now at First Baptist Millington. Can you give the Lord a hand for what He's doing in the life of our church? And what about your pastor, Brother Derek? Oh, if I could, if, uh, Lord, if, if the Lord said, Jackie, what could I do for you? I'd say, Lord, make me tall and slim like Brother Derek. Uh, uh, he, he loves the Lord, and what a preacher, and what a pastor, and your staff. Uh, I'm so blessed. You know, the Bible says that Moses leaned on his staff and died. <laughs> you are blessed with a wonderful staff. I'll tell you, they are incredible. And I can't say enough about this church. One other thought, and then we'll look together to Luke's Gospel in just a moment. Luke's Gospel, chapter 14. You may want to go ahead and find that. Uh, I just want you to know I'm, I believe these are some of the best days in the life of this church. While I was in evangelism, I had the privilege of preaching in some 600 revivals over 14 years. 600 meetings, 600 churches. I've been in big churches and little churches. I've been in all types of churches. But I want to tell you, God's doing something special here at First Baptist Millington. And God's got some good things in store, and the best is yet to come. And I appreciate Brother Derek inviting me and asking me to preach this morning. So let me invite your attention now in God's Word to Luke's Gospel, chapter 14. We're going to read together. I'm going to read uh, Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 16 and reading through verse uh, 24. Now let me give you the context and then I'll share with you the passage. The context is Jesus being invited to a meal. Now that's important. Remember that, please. And he's invited to a meal at the home of a Pharisee, an unnamed Pharisee. And they are discussing Jesus' theology and they're discussing uh, what it means to know the Lord. And this Pharisee apparently was open to what Jesus had to say. And it was a good time. And that, way, that, that meal led into the parable that Jesus is about to share. And it's in the context of a table, of a meal, of a supper. And really what I want to share with you is a message entitled, The Table is Set. When I was a young man, I remember my mama sticking her head out the door on a warm summer afternoon, about five o'clock usually, about time for daddy to get home from work. And she'd say something like this, supper's ready, <laughs> or uh, the table is set. Any of you ever hear that? The supper's ready or the table is set. And I knew that my mama had fixed a fine, fine supper, and it's always going to be wonderful. 
And there was only one time she ever made any exception to that. There, that was the time that she fixed turnip greens. <laughs> now, some of you may be thinking, now, son, how in the world can you be a Baptist preacher from the South and from Alabama originally and not like turnip greens? Now, I, I can't explain it to you, but I really believe in the Old Testament when King Hezekiah went mad and grazed like a cow, it was turnip greens that he ate. <laughs> I don't believe there'll be any in heaven because the Bible says there's nothing there that defileth. So I, <laughs> but if I'm not an expert in many things, but I am an expert on supper time. <laughs> and I am an expert on groceries. <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> For those of you who don't believe in miracles, I tell you, I am a recovering anorexic. <laughs> Doing pretty well, don't you think? But I love this parable that Jesus shares. And let's look at it together, beginning in Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, and verse 16. The table is set. Then said he unto him, that is, the master of ceremonies at the house where they're having the meal. A certain man made a great supper and bade or invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden or invited, come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. And first said unto, the first one said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground. I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused excused. And another said, and this is my favorite, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. And then the master of the house being angry said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And it was done and the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Like most of the parables, this wonderful parable is an earth, earthy story about an eternal truth. Jesus is really talking here about what it means to go to heaven. And he's talking about how God has made a way for you and me to spend eternity with him. The table is set. And I want to share with you several very simple truths this morning. Because I believe with all of my heart in a crowd this size, it is entirely likely that there's somebody who's lonely, somebody who's empty, somebody who's searching somebody who's struggling, somebody maybe who is ensnared, who would give anything for a word of hope, who would give anything to say, uh, to hear what you can do to, to face the tomorrows that are yet to come. And I've got good news for you. God has set the table. God has set the gospel table with peace and forgiveness and grace and mercy and hope and, and a reason for living. And I've got good news for you the table is set this morning at First Baptist Millington for you to know Jesus in a way that you never perhaps thought possible. The table is set, and in that context of that parable, there are these following things that I want us to take note of that are so significant. The first of them is simply this. A great table was prepared. Verse 16, a certain man made a great supper. You and I will never know, church, how much God loves us until we go to Calvary and see Jesus hanging there in our place on Calvary's cross. You know why the table is set, why the gospel table is set and the Lord invites us to come? Because he has paid the price and he's paid a great price to enable you and me to have forgiveness of sins and everlasting and abundant life. No greater price can a man pay than one that will lay down his life, said Jesus. And on Calvary, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. 
Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. The table is set, and a great table was prepared. I want to tell you, some people haven't given their lives to Jesus. Maybe you're one of them, because you think being saved is like a, a fast all the time, and life is no much fun, and you, and you can't do this, and you can't do that, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that. Listen, folks, nothing could be further from the truth. There are some things that the Lord doesn't want us to do, but that's for our well-being. There are some things He does want us to do, they're for our good. But the truth is, God wants us to have life, have it abundantly, and have it joyfully, and have it fully in Christ. And the table is set with a table that is, is so bountifully blessed with forgiveness and grace and, and peace and hope and joy and, and strength and all the things that we can't muster up ourselves. The table is set. A great table was prepared. But also I think it's significant that we notice this morning in this wonderful parable that a gracious invitation was extended. Now it wasn't unusual, and you'll see in the context, for people to invite their friends to a supper. You and I do that and have participated in things like that. And Jesus was dining at the house of a man who had invited his friends over. Jesus goes beyond that and says, the Lord has prepared a table and a gracious invitation was sent out. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. Now, please don't miss this. God sending his personal invitation to every man, woman, boy, and girl in this place this morning. God wants you to be saved. God wants you to go to heaven. God wants your life to be full. God wants your sins to be forgiven. God wants to be real in every heart and in every life. And a great invitation has gone forth. Somebody who counts these things says that there are over 640 invitations in the Bible. Come for all things are ready. Come, today is the day and now is the accepted time. Now I want you to know something. You're, there's nobody in the world more important than you are. No one more significant than you are. And there's nothing on the heart of God more, more significant than for you to know He wants you to be a part of His plan and he wants to be Lord of your life, and he invites you to place your faith, your love, your life in his hands. That's the invitation. It's the will of the Father that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, the Bible tells us that a gracious invitation was extended in verse 17. But something happened, and uh, I, I really think that Dr. Luke uh, was a Baptist. Uh, you'll find out why I think that, because of the excuses that he recorded. Jesus probably said a lot more than that, but this is what Dr. Luke recorded. One man said, I sure appreciate the invitation. Man, I'd love to come. I, I, I appreciate you inviting me, but I can't come because I bought a piece of land and I got to go check it out. Now, it is a poor investment when somebody, man or woman, buys a piece of property without even looking at it. But apparently that was the case. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I'd love to come to your meal now, don't get me wrong. I'm blessed that you asked me, but I've got to go see if they'll plow. I've got to go see if they're worth what I've paid for. Them. Again, doesn't make sense. And then the third guy, he's the one I really get tickled at. I can't come and just got married and you all see the list my wife's got for me to do. I can't possibly come. Now those may sound like simple, insignificant excuses. But what they really were, were refusals. You see, in the Eastern culture, when somebody invited you to come to their home for a meal, it is a great honor and for you to decline that unless it was a major reason was really dishonoring your host. And so the Bible says that, that these people were 
uh, giving excuses for why they wouldn't come. They all began with one, ex one uh, consent to begin to, to make excuse. By the way, I don't know what excuse you may have given or are giving the Lord. I've heard of a lot of excuses through the years. Some folks say, well, I just haven't had that feeling yet. Well, I want you to know, I think I understand what you mean, but the Lord never says you have to have a certain feeling to get saved. Sometimes we call conviction, that conviction that we're lost and we need a Savior, we may call that a feeling. But as far as an emotional high or low, you're saved by, now listen, grace through faith. And it's not by feeling. And some of you are thinking, well, I'll wait till, I'm, till I get things worked out in my life and I get my marriage straight, I get my business, I get my financial affairs in order. I, I get my, my hangups and my hindrances all fixed. Listen, folks, you can't fix all that stuff. If you could have, you would have already. The truth is, Jesus is the great physician. The great physician now is near the sympathizing Jesus. And listen, he brings water for the thirsty. He brings sight to the blind. He brings uh, strength to the lame. He brings freedom to those who are possessed. Jesus sets the sinner free and he washes away all of our sin. You don't need to be giving God excuses why you can't come. You need to run to the table because he says the table is set. A great table was prepared. A gracious invitation was extended. Grievous excuses were given. They all began with one consent. They began to make excuses. I was interested when I was studying this parable to realize that, that Dr. Luke did note that there were some glad responses. The master said, since these people aren't going to come, go out yonder and invite as many as will come. And the, the servant came back and said, Master, good news. Many have come. Many have come. Like some of you who came to Jesus this week at Beach Week. Some have come. And Lord, there's still room. There's still room at the house at the meal. But thank God, some a blind man came and a crippled man came and a woman who had made some very poor decisions morally, she's come and, and the thief on the cross, he's going to be coming. Lord, there are people that are coming. And the, and the real essence of this parable is Jesus has set the gospel table with everything you'll ever need for life abundantly and eternally. But he's always waiting for you to respond to his invitation. There's a very sobering aspect of this parable. Not only were glad responses noted, but a grave declaration was issued. Jesus said when the master, when the servant came back, he said, yes, there's still room, but there are people out there who haven't come. Jesus made this comment, none of those which were bidden, invited, shall taste of my supper. Now, let me tell you what I don't think Jesus is saying. I don't think he's saying if you have ever said no to Jesus, you can never be saved. I don't think he's saying that because most of us have declined the gospel call more than once. But I believe he is saying, now listen, don't miss this. There might well come a time when you'll hear God's call for the last time. There may come a time when God closes the door of opportunity for you to be saved. There may come a time when you reject God's grace for the final time. We call it the unpardonable sin. That, that, that's not named like that anywhere in Scripture, but I believe it is the ultimate rejection of Christ as our Lord and Savior. And the truth is, most of us here have heard God's call and God's invitation over and over and over. And you continue, some do, to say no. And you're in danger of God closing that door. You're in danger of, of crossing God's deadline like J. Harold Smith, the evangelist from Arkansas, said years ago when he preached that great message, God's three deadlines. 
How terrible it would be for you to have been in a gospel church who's singing like this and people around you who love Jesus, who were sold out to the Lord, for you to slip out from a place like this and wind up in eternity without God because you didn't take seriously his invitation. The table is set. I think it interesting, and I, I close with this, that in the Word of God, in the Revelation, chapter 22, verse 17, the final book, the final verses, the final word from the Lord about the table being set. Revelation 22, 17, and the Spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. This thought. You can't straighten your life out, but you can come. Just like you are. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come. You can't straighten things out. You can't fix everything, but you can come. You can't undo the past, but you can come to Jesus just like you are. And I promise you, if you come to Jesus in repentance, which means to turn from sin, and in faith, he'll receive you with arms wide open, and he'll begin that process of transforming and changing your life into what God wants you to be. But he waits for you to come. He's prepared the table. He's paid the price. He's invited you to come. He's told you that he loves you. He wants you to be a part of his eternal family. Now he wants you to come. Come just as you are because the table is set. Let's bow together. With our hearts and heads bowed for just a moment, I'd like to ask you a very personal question. If you were to die today, do you know for certain you'd have a home in heaven? If you don't know that, you can. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm going to lead us in a brief word of prayer. It's a prayer of surrender and submission. And if you'd like to know that you know that you know that you're saved, if you'd like to leave here knowing that your sins are forgiven, and you're a child of the living God, I want you to pray this prayer with me or something like it in your heart silently. But it goes something like this. Dear God, just pray it in your heart silently. If you want to know Jesus as your personal Savior and you, don't, you haven't settled that in your heart already, dear God, forgive me for my sin. I turn away and I'm so sorry for the way that I've lived. And I invite Jesus to come into my heart. I invite Jesus to come into my life and wash away my sin. I trust Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. And Lord, I want today to be, the, to be the beginning of the rest of my life serving Jesus. And today, I take my stand for Christ. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, in just a moment, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. And I'm going to ask, first of all, there may be some of you here who have recently made the decision to give your heart and life to Christ. Several of our young people at the beach this week were wonderfully saved. One trusted Christ during the small groups this morning. You may want to come and just simply say by your coming, you don't have to, but you may want to come and simply say, I'm so glad I've given my heart to Jesus and I want to confess. Just let you know, let the church know, I've given my heart to Jesus. You can do that when we stand and sing in a moment. Or maybe you came in here this morning and it never crossed your mind that God would speak to your heart. But ringing in your heart are the words of the table is set. It's set for you with forgiveness and grace and eternal life and hope and peace and strength. When we stand and sing in a moment, would you just slip out from where you're now seated? Make your way, our pastors will be here at the front. And all you got to do is just simply say, tell me more about what it means to be saved. 
I want to give my heart to Jesus. We'll pray with you, share with you God's Word, give you some material to take home. We'll help you to know what it means to be saved. And maybe there's a child of God discouraged. You're saved, but you're discouraged. You're going through a tough time. And the old devil's trying to beat you up, discourage you. Maybe you just need to come in this old-fashioned altar and just rededicate, re-surrender your heart and life to the Lord. Doesn't mean you get saved again. You just get saved once and it's forever. But there may be many times you need to come and rededicate, re-surrender your life to Christ. Lord, speak to our hearts. Have your way. Thank you that the table is set. We can't work our way, earn our way, or pay our way to heaven. But we can come just like we are and invite Jesus into our hearts. And we do that today for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.